Okay, so the next system we're going to talk about is the female reproductive system. Now, this looks pretty complicated, but let me tell you why I'm going to make it less complicated. Uh, I think to understand female sex hormones, the easiest way to do it is to understand it during the reproductive cycle. In other words, to understand what's happening uh, with women's sex hormones during her menstrual uh, cycle and during her reproductive years. So this looks a heck of a lot more simple when you look at it in a woman who's outside of menopause, but let's start with this. Okay, so the first thing is, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to assume a 28-day cycle. I realize, of course, that is not always the case. There are some women who might have a slightly shorter cycle or a longer cycle. But for the purpose of illustration, let's assume a 28-day cycle, which is about where most women are. The cycle is divided into two phases. Technically three, because there's a menstrual phase here, but let's just acknowledge that the menstrual phase, which starts at day zero, that's the first day of bleeding, even if it's just spotting and it's not a heavy period, that's day zero. That's the shedding of the endometrial lining, which we'll talk about. Then you move into a follicular phase, and the purpose of that phase, which is really driven by follicle-stimulating hormone and estrogen, is to ripen the follicle for ovulation. Ovulation takes place mid-cycle. After ovulation, we move into the luteal phase. The luteal phase is dominated by luteinizing hormone and progesterone, and the purpose of the luteal phase is to prepare the endometrial lining for implantation. Of course, this is something that doesn't occur most of the time, that only occurs during pregnancy, and therefore, when the body realizes hey, we're not pregnant, the endometrial lining gets shed, and that's what results in this crashing progesterone level, and that is the shedding of the lining is, of course, what is the period, which brings us back to here, and the cycle begins again. So let's talk about how these things work from the beginning. So follicle-stimulating hormone, along with luteinizing hormone, are secreted from the pituitary gland, the same place that makes TSH, uh, that we talked about in the thyroid system. And again, the purpose of follicle-stimulating hormone is to get the follicle ready for ovulation. So the follicular phase is really dominated by estrogen and FSH. And of course, the purpose of this is to prepare the body for ovulation. Now, we're very particular about when we like to do a blood test here, especially when a woman is approaching a perimenopausal state. So as a woman is getting closer and closer to menopause, we will really be uh, monitoring the level of FSH and estradiol in about day three, four, or five. And the kind of the canary in the coal mine as a woman is getting close to menopause from a biochemical standpoint is a rising FSH during that phase. So FSH should normally be very low during day three, four, five, which is usually when a woman is still in her period. If FSH starts to climb, especially if estradiol is low, you can be pretty sure that she's heading towards menopause. In fact, Menopause is, you know, chemically uh, demonstrated by a high FSH, typically north of 25, 35, 40, and low estradiol. In fact, a woman who's been in menopause for many years uh, would easily have an FSH level of 50 or higher and unmeasurable levels of estradiol. So again, back to this situation here, FSH is rising. It has a little bit of a peak just before ovulation. Estrogen really rises now, so peak estradiol occurs right at or just before ovulation. The follicle comes out, and away it goes to see if indeed uh, it's going to be uh, met with a sperm, and if so, is it going to attach to the endometrium, etc. Now, this is where we enter the second half of the phase, the luteal phase. This is dominated by luteinizing hormone. So the purpose of luteinizing hormone is to prepare the endometrium for this implantation. Now, what I haven't drawn here, because it's just too complicated, is um, what the thickness is of the endometrial lining as we go from here to here. So, of course, just as a woman is finishing her period, so call it about here, the endometrium is at its thinnest, right? It's just shed that lining, and it's slowly, slowly, slowly building up. And of course, at about day 14, it really starts to build up that lining because it's preparing, again, for that implantation. Progesterone is rising, again rising, and by about day 21, when progesterone peaks, the body figures out if it's pregnant or not. And again, in most cases, it's not. And so, because it's not pregnant, it begins to rapidly drop that progesterone level. Estrogen has also risen for a second peak. So this is the absolute peak of estrogen, but this is a second peak. And both of these hormones come crashing down, and the body begins to shed that endometrium at the end of that cycle. So there are a bunch of things I think I want to say about this. Um, the first is that um, 
you know, any point in time when you get a blood draw on a woman and you are looking at FSH, LH, estradiol, and progesterone, you have to sort of know where you are. Now, once you do a lot of this, you're pretty good at guessing. So it's not rocket science when you're drawing a woman's levels and you see that she has a sky high luteinizing hormone and estradiol to figure out that you probably drew the blood right around the time that she was ovulating. But in cases where it gets a little bit more complicated when women's periods are irregular, when they're becoming, when they're approaching perimenopause, it helps to have some sense of what's going on. And of course, in the case where a woman is not menstruating at all, it tends to be pretty easy because you're going to see very high levels of FSH or LH. Now, it becomes more complicated when a woman has an IUD, and as a result of that, she's not menstruating. But I'm not going to get into those complex situations right now. I just kind of want to go over the basics of the hormone system. The second thing I want to point out, and this point has been made in my podcast before, but I think if you're only coming to this now, it's worth understanding. Um, for many women, What's happening between, between day 21 and day 28 is really profound physiologically. So, uh, you know, we talk about this thing called PMS, and I think any woman who's experienced it knows it's a real thing. I certainly can't say I've experienced it, but I've spoken to enough women who have that um, I have a real sense of why it's probably happening. Now, it's not entirely clear if it's the drop in progesterone that's driving this, but it likely is. Uh, I don't know how well this has been investigated, but we certainly suspect that there are central uh, receptors for progesterone and that in a susceptible woman, when progesterone levels are withdrawn so quickly, that can easily result in mood alterations. So for women who do experience significant uh, and unwanted side effects of progesterone withdrawal, known as you know PMS, a very simple and effective way to treat it is with a low dose of progesterone that is administered starting at day 21 to 28. So how does that work? So again, if a woman who has a fairly regular cycle, she'll know when she ovulates and she'll know about a week after ovulation to take a low dose of progesterone. Typically this is done at about 50 milligrams orally. That's just taken for seven days until she has her period. And what it does is it completely blunts this effect. So this effect is still happening, but her total levels of progesterone are not nearly as dramatic in the reduction. And this tends to ameliorate symptoms. So what's the drawback of that approach? Well, from a physiologic perspective, none. The biggest drawback is just the logistics of having to remember that seven days out of every 28, you have to take progesterone. This is an entirely safe thing to do. And I've used this with a number of women in the past. It seems to work very well. Uh, alternatively, women can stretch that out and take progesterone for the entire 14 days following their follicular, uh, pardon me, following their ovulation. And of course, they can take oral contraceptives throughout but again, now that's creating a whole new set of issues around oral contraceptives, uh, which many women simply don't want to do. So I just point that out to say one, um, I think when you look at a graph like this, hopefully you get an appreciation for what a profound level of uh, withdrawal a woman is experiencing during the end of the luteal phase. And secondly, that there are lots of hormonal ways to address that. Now, the other hormone I haven't drawn on here is testosterone. I haven't drawn it for two reasons. The first is it doesn't change that much during the cycle. It changes a little bit. Um, I've read a number of different studies that have looked at it. Most of them suggest a peak testosterone about here when you have peak estradiol, but the fluctuation is so minor that I don't think it adds any value to this. Secondly, if I were to draw testosterone to scale on this graph, you'd have to look at the ceiling. That's how much more testosterone a woman has in her body than estrogen. Yes, I just said that. It sounds very counterintuitive, but it's true. A woman has, even at peak estradiol level, which is during ovulation, a woman has five to 10 times more testosterone in her body than she does estradiol. It's just that it's not changing all that much. It is unfortunately going away when she enters menopause, which is what I wanna talk about next. So as a woman leaves her reproductive years, what's happening? Well, her body is less able to make estradiol and progesterone. And as estradiol and progesterone production go down, just as testosterone production goes down in a male, although it happens far less abruptly, the pituitary gland senses this because there's a negative feedback loop and it says, I want more. So it starts making more FSH and more LH. 
And of course, the higher those go, at some, initially the body responds and you'll see a period where the cycle does continue. Sometimes it spreads out, it gets a little bit longer, but the body is able to compensate until of course it isn't. So when a woman is in menopause, what you'll see is no estrogen, no progesterone, very high LH, very high FSH. And so when we initiate hormone replacement therapy, and by the way, we never want to wait until a woman is in that state where she has flatline estradiol, flatline progesterone, sky high FSH, sky high LH. We want to do it long before that. We want to do it as she's transitioning from this into that. And that could be literally a year or two years prior to that state. And what we're doing is we're giving her enough estradiol that her FSH usually ends up hovering around 20 to 30. Again, that's still a pretty high level of FSH, um, meaning that's still got the brain thinking, I want more estradiol, but you don't need to give maximum amounts of estradiol. We're simply trying to um, control the vasomotor symptoms, so the hot flashes, the night sweats, the vaginal symptoms, atrophy, dryness, and perhaps most importantly, cardiovascular risk factors and uh, bone risk factors. So estrogen being the most important hormone, both in men and women, as it regulates uh, sending the signal of uh, tension on the bone into bone building via osteoblasts. So in summary, that's the look at the female endocrine system. Again, it's much more complicated than the male endocrine system, uh, sex endocrine system, because of both the cyclic nature of it and the abruptness with which it goes away. Um, but again, I think it's something that everyone needs to understand because if you're a woman, you should understand this. And frankly, if you know a woman and you care about a woman, you should understand this. And it certainly would hopefully give empathy to um, women who are struggling during that last portion of their luteal phase. Again, uh, men don't have an equivalent of this. We don't have a scenario whereby we're having a tenfold reduction in a major sex hormone that occurs over the course of a week. Uh, so I think it's understandable why that can pose issues for some women. So in summary, I think you can see that the female sex hormones are a little bit more complicated than what you're going to see in a moment, which is the male equivalent. Um, but I think it's also actually a more interesting system. Um, by understanding how this works, you have a sense of whether a woman is typically getting closer to menopause, which is generally one of our considerations as we're looking at these hormone levels. And as a woman is entering that perimenopausal period, you wanna be especially attentive to the time in which you draw. Again, day three, four, five become the most important blood draws as a woman is becoming perimenopausal because it's that FSH level at day three, four, and five that becomes your canary in the coal mine. If that level starts creeping up and it's over 10, 11, 12, even though she's not in menopause, I'm going to tell her she's probably getting close, and that's when we start to have our discussion about what hormone replacement therapy looks like.